This video series is to accompany the Cisco Netacad IT Essentials 7.0 course. This video covers Chapter 4, Preventative Maintenance and Troubleshooting. In Chapter 4, we're going to look at preventative maintenance and the troubleshooting process. Preventative maintenance. There are clear benefits to preventative maintenance. Um, one of the um, steps that we use or one of the factors is computer location or environment. You have to look at where the computer is located. Dusty environments such as a construction site or in a manufacturing facility, they do require more attention than an office environment because you have more dust and uh, just things in, things in the air that are going to get sucked into that computer. Also computer use, high traffic networks such as a school network, they might require additional scanning or updates and removal of malicious software and unwanted files versus a small office. Dust is one of the things that you're going to have to pay close attention to. Using a cloth or a duster to clean the outside of a computer case. If you're using a cleaning product, you want to be very careful about um, is it going to harm the computer. So you want to put a small amount onto the cleaning cloth and then wipe the outside of the case. Do not spray the cleaning product on directly onto the case. You also want to dust on the outside of a computer. Uh, that can travel through cooling fans to the inside, so keep the uh, outside of fans clean. This is just nasty. This should have never occurred. Accumulated dust prevents the flow of air and reduces the cooling of components. And then hot computer components are more likely to break down or fail. And then you also want to remove dust from the inside of a computer using a combination of compressed air, low airflow ESD vacuum cleaner, and a small lint-free cloth. You do not want to blow air directly onto fans and have sp fans spin freely. You can uh, mess fans up that way. So you want to make sure that if you are going to spray any fans, that you make uh, hold those fans and don't let them spin when you're spraying them with air. A basic checklist of components to inspect for dust and damages include the CPU heat sink and fan assembly. You don't need to take the heat sink and CPU off, but you do want to check it for dust and make sure that it's not clogged or any obstructions are in the way. You also want to check your RAM modules and make sure any dust or anything's not built up in between those. Storage devices, you want to make sure that those are clean and, and clear for airflow. Adapter cards, make sure cables haven't collected any of dust or accumulated anything. Power devices and keyboard and mice, uh, mouse, you want to make sure that those are clean. Uh, keeping a keyboard clean is necessary. You can, you know, dump it over, get all the grime and nut and stuff out of it. Keyboards probably accumulate more nastiness um, and, and dust and things than any other part of the computer. Environmental concerns. An optimal operating environment for a computer is a clean, free of contaminants and within the temperature and humidity range specified by the manufacturer. And you can always go onto the manufacturer's website and find out what those are. So uh, a humidity percentage, you don't want it too humid, you don't want it too low of humidity, and you also want an optimum temperature range. You want to make sure that installed software is current and up to date, patches are being applied. You want to follow the policies of the organization when installing security updates, any updates to the operating system, and program updates. You want to create a software maintenance schedule to check and review and install appropriate security software and driver updates. You want to update the virus definition files and scan for viruses and spyware. And you want to remove any unwanted or unused programs, um, and that can be for any number of reasons. Uh, unwanted programs, maybe unlicensed programs that were installed that can um, come back to um, harm the company as far as uh, financial impact. So you want to make sure that those are checked. And then you want to scan hard drives for errors and defragment any hard drives, uh, not SSD drives, but the older spin drives. The troubleshooting process. Troubleshooting is one of the things that I look for when I've hired uh, people to work with me or for me is someone that has good troubleshooting skills is valuable. So what you want to do is make sure that you understand the troubleshooting process. It does require an organized and logical approach to problems with computers and other components. And it is a skill refined over time. It's not just something that somebody knows how to do. It is a skill and, it, and the more you do it and the more you work with it, the better you're going to get at it. So before you begin troubleshooting problems, always follow the necessary precautions to protect data on a computer. You want to make sure that you have the proper backups and other patches and things that applied before um, you proceed with the troubleshooting process. Now, there are six steps to the troubleshooting process. You are going to need to know these for the exam in this course and for the CompTIA A-plus exam. These are uh, 
a part of the uh, exam process. So you want to make sure that you understand these and it's just good to know these. So first you want to identify the problem. What is the main problem? So for example, you walk up to a computer and it's just not turning on. Well, the identify the problem is you have no power, maybe, or the computer's not turning on. That's the problem. The computer will not turn on. Then step two, you want to establish a theory and probable cause. And I'm going to use the same um, issue that we have. The computer will not turn on. So what's the theory? Well, maybe the power's turned off. Well, you can kind of look around the room. Is there power to the entire building? Did the, did the power go off for the entire building? Or is it just that computer? So then you can check to see, is, it, is the computer plugged in? Then you can test the theory, step three, to determine the cause. Check the power cable at the back. Was it pulled out of the wall? Did something trip a breaker? Um, you know, you're going to need to test on what's what's causing the computer not to turn on. Then step four, you want to establish a plan of action to resolve the problem and implement the solution. So let's say, for example, the power cord was unplugged or a breaker was tripped. Well, the solution or the plan of action is to maybe get an electrician to turn the breaker back on or the maintenance person to turn the breaker back on or you do it yourself or you have a UPS that's died or you have a uh, power supply that's um um, and, and this happened recently in my house. Uh, we had a um, uh, we had a power strip, and the power strip went bad, and so we had to replace it with a different power strip. Then step five, you want to verify the full system functionality, and if applicable, implement preventative measures to make sure it doesn't happen again. And then step six, you want to document your findings, actions, and outcomes. Now, something for like a computer not being turned on, and let's say the power strip went bad, you may not necessarily need to document that other than for the company. Let's just say you had a power strip go bad and you need to, um, you had one in storage um, in the IT department and you need to replace that. So that's maybe why you would need to document that and what are the actions and what are the outcomes so that IT help people behind you or later on will know that that happened. Now, step one, identifying the problem. We're going to go into a little bit more depth here, but I'm going to go uh, in, in the class. You'll go into uh, really in depth into these six steps, but I'm going to go through them rather quickly on the um, video here. Um, you just get the, you know, this is an example. You'd get the customer information. You would get the computer configuration, uh, problem description. What's, you know, ask open-ended questions and closed-ended questions. When did this occur? Was there, you know, wh what happened? What were you doing at the time? What was the last thing that you did? Um, you know, is there anything else you need to tell me about it? And users will not always give you the correct information. Um, you need to ask questions to get the information out of them in some cases. You know, check for error messages. Were there any beep sequences? Um, are there any LED lights? Um, check the, you know, power on self-test. Um, I can give you an example in my career where um, network wasn't working. I looked on the back of the, and I, and I started diagnosing and trying to figure out why the network wasn't working. I started looking at drivers and I started, I spent about five minutes on the actual software side trying to figure out what was going on. I then had a, you know, a little bit of a light bulb go off and I looked around at the back of the computer and the network cable had been come unplugged. And I could tell by the lights, there was no light activity on the network cable being plugged into the back of the computer. It had been, it didn't come, it had come out somehow. And I could have saved about five minutes of time just by looking at the back to begin with. So always check um, to identify all of the problems and all of the things that are occurring. And then you want to establish a theory. You know, is the device powered off before you start working on it? Does it need to be powered off? Check the power switch for an outlet, uh, surge protection, uh, loose cable connections, non-bootable disk is designated as a boot drive. You want to just establish what is going on. Then you want to test it, common steps to determine the cause, ensure the device is powered on, you know, maybe maybe cycle the power, verify the boot order, and you always want to start with the simple things first. I just gave you the example of the network cable being plugged in. Always check the simple things first, because if you can solve something in 30 seconds, why spend, you know, 10, 15 minutes working on trying to fix something if it's a simple solution? If it's just that, you know, the power strip went bad and that happened... As an example, I just gave you recently in my house, a power strip went bad, but we thought something else was going on with the computer. We had just purchased a new computer. It kept powering off and we didn't know why. We, we were like, we've got a bad computer. And we started going through the process and I was like, well, let's check the simple things. We replaced the power supply or the power strip and it was the power strip. It was an older power strip and we should have bought a new one for the new computer. Step four, establish a plan of action. If there's no solution being achieved in the previous step, uh, you may need to do further research. So you may have to um, escalate the help desk ticket to um, a higher level. Uh, you might need to check the manufacturer's website. 
look at technical websites, get out, on, get on, get out on the internet and see if others are having the same kind of problems. Let's say that you upgraded recently a driver um, and the driver is having problems and other people are having it. Maybe you need to roll that driver back. So you want to check um, things that are happening to others and see if others are posting about it and just check internet, uh, check online forums, device manuals, computer manuals. It's, it's a research project at that point. And then after you get the fix in place, you want to reboot the computer, make sure it's all working, ensure multiple applications work properly, verify the network and internet connections are working, uh, maybe print a document from one application. What you want to do is what I have done in my uh, past of working in a help desk is I have the user sit down and do a few tasks. I let them do it because they know what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I just let them go through a few things like, you know, could they send an e was, were they having problems sending email? And I went through the troubleshooting process. We fixed that problem. And then I say, hey, could you send a couple of test messages? And then I would have them send them to me to make sure that they, I was getting them received and then send them back to them to make sure. And you always want to make sure that it's fully working properly for the user before you leave the area. Nothing is more frustrating for a user than for you to say it's fixed. You walk away and then they have problems continuing and then they have to escalate the issue again. So you always want to make sure if you're working in the area to get that problem fixed before you close the ticket or um, you move on, make sure the user is satisfied with the solution. And then document. You want to discuss the solution implemented with the customer. If it was something that the customer caused, you want to, in a tactful manner, explain to the customer what they did wrong or what they, not necessarily what they did wrong, but what they could do to resolve that the next time and say, well, in helping you to make sure this doesn't happen again, here's some steps you could do. Don't say you did this wrong. That's not a good way to do it. Uh, being tactful is just saying, well, here's what, here's what happened and here's how we can prevent this in the future. Um, you know, if it was a power strip, just say, hey, we replaced the power strip. Uh, you've got a new one. This one should be good to go for a while. If it was something um, the customer did that they do need to correct, then again, just be tactful with it. Provide the customer with paperwork or follow-up emails. Uh, document the steps taken to solve the problem. Make sure the customer understands um, what happened. Um, you don't have to give them full details. You don't need to break down every little detail of what happened, but you can explain in a high level, kind of a, in a, a summary of what happened so they understand what was going on. So, you know, for example, with the power strip, you know, just tell, tell the customer, hey, this power strip went bad. It happens. Um, we hope it doesn't happen in the future, but you do have a new one and we're going to go forward. Or if there was a problem with the email and just say, here's what we did to solve the problem. Here's the fix. And in the future, if you have any problems, make sure you get, get with us. You want to document any components used in the repair. And then you want to document the amount of time spent to resolve the problem. This is, this is key in documenting your work um, for a company to um, because you will... One of the things I have experienced in the past is I've had higher level management tell me, well, why do we even need help desk people? Because what do you actually do? You're just kind of, a, you know, you, know, you don't actually do anything. And documenting your time and documenting um, and the whole process, the whole six steps, documenting everything is important so that you can say, here's why it's critical to have help desk. Here's why it's critical to have this problem solving process in place. Common problems and solutions. Um, some common problems are storage devices. Um, they often are related to loose or incorrect cabling connections. Cables do become loose in computers, believe it or not. With computers being turned off and on, they do heat up and cool down. And I have had cables come loose in the past in my in my um, um, work career and in my personal computers. I've had cables work themselves loose. Um, incorrect drive and media formats and incorrect jumpers and BIOS settings can sometimes take place. Sometimes just updating the BIOS fixes a problem. Uh, BIOSes are get older and the newer software, let's say maybe Windows or Linux or Mac, um, you know, or Linux, Linux, or I'm going to say Windows more often. Windows updates itself or you, they, you get some new hardware drivers and the BIOS settings need to be updated to keep up with those new um, device drivers. Your motherboard and internal components, they can... Um, Problems can be caused by incorrect or loose cables, failed components, it happens, incorrect drivers or corrupted updates that happen. Your power supply can become bad over time due to brownouts or uh, power outages, uh, loose connections, inadequate wattage. Let's say you added extra components into your computer, but you didn't change the uh, power supply. Uh, maybe you're right at the edge of power wattage and you don't know it and it, so it starts creeping up. CPU and memory. Processor and memory problems are often caused by faulty installations. You want to check and make sure that the memory was installed correctly. Make sure the BIOS settings are correct. Make sure you have adequate cooling and ventilation. And on displays, 
they are often caused by incorrect settings, loose connections and incorrupt and corrupted drivers. I can tell you right before I created this video or in the process of creating this video, Windows did an update to me and it changed my settings because I, I use multiple monitors and they changed my monitor settings all around. My output for my, um, for my audio went from my main monitor to my secondary monitor um, and, it, and it started showing my main monitor as my secondary monitor and I have no idea why Windows did that but it just made the changes in the background and I didn't do it. And so I had to go back through and fix everything. So just check settings like that because sometimes with updates that happens. Now, common problems and solutions for storage drives. Um, maybe a computer is not recognizing a storage device. You might check the loose cables. Uh, make sure that the jumpers are set correctly. If you're having jumpers, uh, make sure that it's you know not getting overheated. Make sure you have good proper airflow. Uh, reset jumpers, replace storage devices, reset device settings in the BIOS. For motherboards and in internal components, make sure that the CMOS battery is is not loose. It might be dead, so you might need to change. You might need to replace the battery. Um, when I worked in help desk, we we I kept a, a few extra uh, of the batteries in stock just in case we had a computer that was getting older and sometimes they go bad. And so we would just pop the battery out and I didn't have to, I didn't have to spend a couple hours going to a store. I just had a couple of them in storage. For power supplies, make sure that you check the power supply. Make sure no one's t uh, you know, moved any buttons on the back of the computer. Make sure the power cables are plugged in properly. Power cables do can become loose over time with heating and the cooling. Um, if you smell some burning electronics or if there's smoke coming com from your computer, uh, make sure you turn it off. If you check out a video on my YouTube channel from a long time ago, I have a video of a component on a computer burning and the, the little chip starts burning and smoke coming off of it. And it's, it's this, it's this distinctive odor of electronic smell, electronic burning, and you'll, you'll know it when you smell it. Or if you don't know it, it's, it's a distinctive smell. And you want to make sure that you turn off your components, uh, make sure that you get the device outside or into clear air and make sure that uh, you replace that if you need to. CPUs and memories, make sure if the computer is shutting down or locking up, check for heating, uh, check for overheating, uh, make sure that your RAM is seated properly. Um, one of the things I've had to do just recently is make sure uh, in change, I was diagnosing some memory issues on a computer and I just changed the slots that the RAM was in. Or I, I had four sticks of RAM in the computer. I removed two of them to see if, and I, and I started selectively putting them back in to see and trying to diagnose which memory stick was bad. And it turned out that none of them were bad. It was just, it was just, I was having um, driver issues. If you're getting reboots, check your memory or check your error messages on your operating system to see what the last error message was before the computer shuts down. Um, if you are upgrading your uh, your com uh, your CPU, make sure that things were seated properly, that you have proper cooling. Uh, you know, is the CPU fan turning properly? You can check those settings either there in the BIOS or with software on your operating system. For displays, you want to make sure you just diagnose, and these are simple where you just go through and you say, is it displaying properly? Um, check all the settings, make sure if you know if you want to make sure it's on the right uh, hertz, uh, make sure that the cables haven't come loose, uh, make sure that, um, that you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of a, um, you know, j just checking to see what's going wrong and then checking for solutions. You know, if it's a multiple monitor setup, make sure that the displays are aligned properly in the software color patterns and screens are correct. So you might pull up a white screen to make sure you are not having any dark patterns on, or you pull up a black dark screen to see if there's anything going on, or you run a video test, uh, different things like that. Now it's good to keep personal reference tools. Um, personal reference tools include troubleshooting guides, manufacturing manuals, quick reference guides, repair journals. So if you're working in a help desk and you've got all of one type of computer, uh, let's say it's an Asus computer or an HP or a Dell, um, you want to make sure that you have quick access to those types of repair journals and information for that particular models that you're working with or those computers. Um, in addition to an invoice, a technician keeps a journal of upgrades and repairs. You can take notes as you go through the troubleshooting process and repair process and refer to those notes to avoid repeating steps or pass those on to somebody else so they don't repeat the same steps. You can also keep a journal. That includes the descriptions of the problem, possible solutions that have been tried, uh, steps taken to repair the problem, and then note any configuration changes, and that helps you remember it. Let's say a week from now, it, the same problem starts happening, or a year from now, the problem starts happening again. You can go back to your journal and say, oh yeah, this was the solution. Human memory is not the best. 
And so if we have notes in a journal, it, it, it helps uh, return our memory or helps us refer to our memory and what we've done in the past. And then keeping a history of your repairs, making a detailed list of problems and repairs, including the date that can also come in handy because let's say that you start having a, um, a number of computers start having the same type of problems. Then you can say, hey, there's a trend here and maybe we're having a problem with the memory sticks that we bought from this company. And that, that's, a, you know, in four or five computers now, I've had problems with the same thing. But if you didn't keep a history of that, you may not know that that's a, a trend that's happening. Internet reference tools, uh, make sure that you have good sources of information about specific hardware problems and possible solutions. I can tell you for computers that I support, um, I have quick links to the manufacturer's website, the PDF files I've downloaded. Um, you can also check out news groups, manufacturer FAQs, um, online forums and chats, and then technical websites that might be, con um, might be connected to the uh, hardware and, and software that you're working with.